Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hananiga High School. I'm Brian Brown, and today we'll be looking at our last set of notes over Chapter 10. Now, first, Chapter uh, Section 10.7 deals with kinetic molecular theory. Remember, kinetic molecular theory is a model that helps us understand how and why particles do what they do based upon the conditions that they're under. So it's a way in which we look at why gases do what they do based upon how they're moving, how they're interacting, what their velocities are, and so forth. Now, kinetic molecular theory says gases consist of large numbers of molecules that are in continuous random motion. The combined volume of all the molecules of the gas is negligible relative to the total volume in which the gas is contained. So if you actually added up all the individual volumes and compared it to the total volume of the container, you would see that the individual volumes are a very, very, very small portion of the overall volume of the container itself. Fundamentally, this translates to individual gas molecules have a negligible volume. Now, what else is negligible is the attractive and repulsive forces that exist between the molecules. Now, remember the term negligible does not mean they don't exist. What it means is the attractive forces that are there because of speeds and distance and so forth is irrelevant. So while there are attractive and repulsive forces, for all intents and purposes, they're negligible between the gas particles because they're moving at such great speeds with such great distance between them. Now another thing that kinetic molecular theory says is that the average kinetic energy of a substance at a given temperature is constant. And this doesn't mean that all the particles are moving at the same speed because kinetic energy is related to velocity by the equation 1 half mv squared. But if you're at a constant temperature, you're at a constant average kinetic energy. So particles can be transferred. So as particles collide, energy can be transferred between the two, but the average kinetic energy won't change. So however much one particle picks up, the other particle loses. So there's no net change in kinetic energy as long as the temperature remains constant. Now the diagram you're looking at here is a diagram that's uh, commonly used to look at the relationship between the speeds of the particle and the average kinetic energy. Now in this case what, case, what we're really looking at is what's called a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So anytime you ever see a graph that looks like that, we're talking about a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. There are two scientists who were studying the relationship between the speeds of molecules and what portion of the sample are at that given speed. So on the y-axis, we have the fraction of molecules. And on the x-axis, we have a molecular speed. And you can see the distribution of those different speeds of particles in the sample. Now the average kinetic energy of the molecule is proportional to the absolute temperature. So when you look at the blue situation, which is zero degrees Celsius, and the red, which is at 100 degrees Celsius, you're increasing in temperature, and you'll see that there is a resulting increase in average kinetic energy. Now this symbol here, U, which a lot of people confuse with average kinetic energy, is not the average kinetic energy. It's closely related to it. It's what's known as the RMS speed, which we'll get into in a second. But if the hills basically has the highest point right here, and if you look at the distribution, there are more fast-moving particles than there are slow-moving particles, that means the average is going to be somewhere to the right of the hill. And you can see in these two situations, the blue versus the red, the red has a higher average speed, which means, in other words, a higher fraction of particles at a, at a uh, certain speed, than the, as you increase temperature, you're increasing the average kinetic energy. So remember, temperature is proportional to the average kinetic energy of a sample. And that's one of the things that you can see in this diagram. Now, one thing you have to be careful, a lot of people look at this in a test and say, well, the blue one is the higher temperature because it's got a higher hill. Remember, these are the fraction of the molecules on this axis. So really the area underneath the curve of the blue curve and the area underneath the red curve has to be identical to each other. So the total number of particles represents 100%. Well, it represents 100% in each case. Well, if we're increasing the average speed, we're getting more high speed particles, that means the height of the hill has to be lower. So when you look at Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions, the lowest hill is always going to be your highest temperature situation. 
Now, u, and I mentioned this a second ago, is not actually the average speed. It's what's known as the root mean square speed. So for simplicity's sake, we usually call this the RMS speed. So RMS speed is what u actually represents here. Now, this is the speed of a molecule possessing average kinetic energy. So if we look at, well, what is the average kinetic energy? And we found out what is the speed of that particle at average kinetic energy we would have what's known as the RMS speed. So remember, the RMS speed is not the average speed of a particle, although they're very, very close to each other. What it really is is the speed of a molecule possessing average kinetic energy. So if the kinetic energy equation is 1 half mv squared, and u represents the speed of a molecule possessing average kinetic energy, when we plug into the 1 half mv squared equation, we would get the average kinetic energy. So as average kinetic energy is increasing, if m is going to be the same, then the RMS speed has to be increasing. So they're proportional as well. So temperature is proportional to average kinetic energy, which is proportional to both the average speed as well as the root mean square speed. And the difference between the two, RMS and the average speed, is very, very, very small. So we often use them as interchangeable because the difference is very small between the two, uh, but it's not quite the same thing. Remember, RMS speed is the speed of a particle at average kinetic energy, not the average speed of a particle, but they are closely related to each other. And the actual calculation, how would you calculate RMS speed? Well, that would equal the square root of 3RT over M, uh, big M, which is molar mass. So if you put in your temperature, plug in your molar mass, you can calculate what the RMS speed is. In other words, the speed of a particle at average kinetic energy. Now, section 10.8 gets away from kinetic molecular theory and looks at effusion and diffusion and Graham's law. Now, effusion is the escape of a gas through a tiny hole into an evacuated space. So what you're seeing here in the picture would represent effusion. Now, a situation that's related to effusion would be gas escaping from a balloon. What really happens is the balloon looks solid, but the actual surface of the balloon has tons of tiny little holes in it in those gaps between particles. So what you really have is a gas escaping through those holes. So the rate of effusion of the gas, in this case, um, helium is, uh, the balloon is becoming smaller over time as the helium escapes, much faster than is happening with the nitrogen. So that would mean helium is going to effuse faster than the nitrogen is. Now, what controls your rate of effusion? Well, it's not really about particle size. I mean, heliums aren't smaller, so they move through those uh, membranes more easily. It's really about velocity, and we'll come back to that in a second after we get into fusion. Now, that's what a fusion is, how fast you escape from a small hole. Diffusion is how fast a substance spreads out in a space or throughout a second substance. So what you're looking at here is we've got a particle, and then over time it's moving all over the place, but eventually it ends up over here. So how fast is it spreading out in this container? That's what diffusion is. Now, one thing to think about with the concept of diffusion. Now, if you actually look at the speed of air molecules, so we look at the, the speed of an oxygen or a nitrogen. Now, they're not moving at the exact same speed, but they're at least in the general ballpark of each other. So if we look at the average speed of an air molecule, it's moving really, really fast. 1,150 miles per hour is on average what the molecules in this move are moving at right now. Well, why does it take so long for a substance to diffuse if the particles of a gas are moving so rapidly around the room? Well, take a look at the lines. It's not a straight line. It's a bunch of jagged lines. And that's because of the collisions. Now, we say that gases are spread out, and compared to liquids and solids, they are very, very, very spread out. But there's still a lot of gas particles in this room. In fact, the air molecules in this room and a particle moving around, air molecules collide about every 60 nanometers. Now remember, a nano is a billionth of a meter. So every 60 billionths of a meter, the air molecules in this room are colliding with another particle. So when we say, you know, they're far apart, compared to solids and liquids, they're very far apart. But they're still colliding all the time as they move around this room. And that's why it takes them so long to spread out, is because it's going to collide and collide and collide and eventually diffuse throughout the room. Now, the distance between collisions is actually known as the mean free path. So on average, how far are you free to move before you collide with something? And obviously, if we had less gas particles inside this room, the mean free path would be larger, and therefore things would diffuse faster. But if we're looking at consistently what's happening inside this room, 
uh, the mean free path is going to be relatively constant. So why would things diffuse faster? Well, it's all about speed. So diffusion and effusion are really tied to the speed of the particles. The faster they're moving, the faster they're going to diffuse, and the faster they're going to effuse. And really, what moves faster? Well, to get to the same energy, smaller particles have to be moving faster. So the equation here is kinetic energy is one-half mv squared. So if I have two gases at the same temperature, that means their kinetic energies are the same. So if then there's in this room at the same constant temperature, then they're at the same average kinetic energy. But remember, the average kinetic energies of the two, while they're equal to each other, that doesn't mean the masses and the velocities have to be equal to each other. So to get to the same energy, small particles have to move faster. So if the kinetic energy of A is in the same, let's say we've got two gases, A and B, and they're in the same room. That means they're at the same temperature, which means they're at the same average kinetic energy, which means the m half one, uh, one half mv squared of A has to equal the one half mv squared of B. That doesn't mean the mass and the velocities are going to be the same, because obviously if we have two different gases, A and B are not going to weigh the same. Well, to get to the same 1 half mv squared, the heavier gas has to be moving slower. So the larger m is, the smaller v is going to be. So remember, lighter gases are going to move faster, which means they're going to fuse and diffuse faster as well. Now, if we rearrange this equation a little bit here, we're going to derive what's known as Graham's Law. So we're going to take our 1 half mv squared of our two different gases, which are equal to each other, and we're going to rearrange it a little bit. So it's based upon kinetic energy. That's where Graham's Law comes from. First, we're going to get rid of the 1 half by multiplying both sides by 2, and we're going to get the masses and velocities on the same side. Notice when we do that, we invert the A and the B. So the velocity squared of A over the velocity squared of B equals the molar mass of B over the molar mass of A. So Graham's Law is an inverse law. They flipped. The second thing is we're going to get rid of the squares by taking the square root of each side, and that means Graham's Law is going to be reduced to this. And that's why we refer to Graham's Law as an inverse square root law. So it's an inverse square relationship. Now, these velocities are ratios of velocities, and they could be the speed, or they could be the rate of effusion or the rate of diffusion. So our general way of writing Graham's Law would be the rate of A over the rate of B equals the square root of the molar mass of B over the molar mass of A. And this is an equation that sometimes you're going to be calculating the ratio of rates, how much faster does one gas effuse than another, and sometimes you're going to be using it to find the molar mass of an unknown substance. So we do Graham's Law types of calculations in a couple of different ways. But remember, the rate ratio is interchangeable with the effusion ratio, which is interchangeable with the diffusion ratio. They're all equal to each other. Now first, if we're going to find the rate ratio. So in other words, how much faster is uh, helium than neon, if that's what we're calculating. Um, when you go to do those type of problems, first you're going to decide what A is, and that's usually going to be the one listed first, and what B is, because that's going to set up the rest of our equation. So if we want to find out how much faster helium is than neon, helium would be A, and neon would be B. And that's going to establish on the molar mass side, so it was helium to neon, helium is A, because remember it was rate of A over rate of B, that means they're going to be flipped on the other side. So when we look at the molar mass side, they're going to be flipped from each other. So that's why when you're finding the rate ratio, it's so important that you establish, establish what A and B is. So if it says how much faster is helium than neon, then helium is the A and neon is the B. And it's going to be neon on top over here and helium on the bottom when we actually go to calculate our rate ratio. So then you separate or, or you set up the equation and solve appropriately. Now, when you're finding molar masses, there's a couple of other situations that can come up. The first thing you're going to do is establish a rate ratio. So it says something like um, helium diffuses three times faster than neon. So that means we have a three to one. That's what three times faster is. Now that establishes because our bigger number then is going to be our faster gas. So in this case, helium was faster, so the 3 is going to go with helium. And that's really important because if we know helium and we don't know what the other gas is, our other gas is going to be our unknown. That would mean it's the molar mass of the unknown on top and the molar mass of helium on the bottom. 
Now, since we know it's helium and we know helium is three times faster, we're really left with in a situation where this is our only unknown. You solve for that unknown. So first you're going to establish your rate ratio. And from there, you're going to use that to figure out what the unknown substance's molar mass is. But it's important you understand what your ratio means. If helium is three times faster than our unknown, then helium is three and our unknown is one. That means helium is A and our unknown is B in our molar mass component. So which gas is faster? Well, that's going to become the bigger number in the rate ratio and establish what A and B is. Now, if you have times instead of rates, let's say it doesn't say that helium is three times faster than our unknown. Let's say it puts it in terms of the length of time. Well, remember, velocity versus the length of time would be opposite. So a big velocity means a short time. So you have to understand that's going to change things a little bit. So if you have times instead of rates, since time is inversely proportional to the rate, remember the bigger the time is it takes something to happen, the shorter the speed was for it, you're going to put the larger number on top, and this is going to represent the faster substance in the rate ratio. So remember, A is going to represent the faster substance. So if one thing is three times faster than the other, the three is going to be our faster substance, which is going to end up being our smaller one. And if it says that something takes six times longer, so then our ratio would be six over one, and the six would be our slower gas, which is going to be our heavier one. So really, what you do is you look at these and set up that rate ratio first and use that to determine what A and B are. And that's really what's important because remember, it's an inverse relationship. You have to establish in your rate ratios or your time ratios what's A and what's B so you can invert it on the other side. But remember, in this case, it's opposite. So when you're doing the time situation, the faster one is on the bottom and the slower one is on the top. So if it, A took six times longer, that means A is the slower gas, or I should say the one on top. The six is the slower gas, and the time would be the faster gas. And remember, this is going to equal the square root of the molar mass of B, so I'm going to put mm here just to make it more clear, over the molar mass of A. So you have to establish which one is the faster gas and which one is the slower gas in order to get your A and B in the right place. And once again, once you've done that, you can set up the equation and solve. Now, the next section gets into real versus ideal gas. So this finishes out the set of notes. Now, in the real world, behavior of gases um, really only converts to ideal gas equation predictions when you're at relatively high temperatures and low pressures. Now, normal everyday temperatures and pressures are high enough in temperature and low enough in pressure that gases do usually behave ideally. So most gases that we're studying under normal temperature and pressure situations behave ideally. So the calculations we're doing with ideal gas law would bear out and they would make sense. But as you get to lower and lower in temperatures and higher and higher pressures, your predictions using the ideal gas law are going to slowly start to differ from what they really are. Now, this picture that you're looking at over here, if PV equals nRT, then N would equal PV over RT. So let's say we have a situation where we have one mole of a gas. Well, it's PV over RT would predict, if it's behaving ideally, one. So if we had one mole of a gas and we use PV over RT to see how we predict our number of moles to be, we would end up with one. So this is our ideal gas situation. We have one mole of a gas, and when we do our PV over, N, or over RT calculation, we always get one. Well, most gases only will be at exactly that one under relatively normal temperature and pressure conditions. As you increase the pressure, it's going to start to deviate from our ideal. As you increase the temperature, it's also going to deviate from the ideal. And you can see that here. The one with the highest temperature, which would be this one, is a gas behaving most like it's an ideal gas under all pressures. Down here under normal temperatures and pressures, um, or normal pressures, it behaves ideally. Once you get to very high pressures, it's no longer ideal. So most gases um, under normal conditions behave as an ideal gas. But under lower temperatures and under higher pressures, they behave like a real gas. And our calculations of PV equals NRT no longer function. 
So what assumptions of kinetic molecular theory break down at high pressure and low temperature? So what's really happening under those two conditions? Well, under high pressure, what really happens and under low temperature is you're basically messing with some of our assumptions of kinetic and molecular theory. We assumed that the total volume of the individual gas particles was a very, very small compared to the overall volume. Well, when you pack par gas particles very close together under very high pressure, that goes out the window. So each gas molecule no longer has a negligible volume. And under low temperature situations, remember, speed kills attractive forces. And as you slow down the particle by losing energy and getting to a lower temperature situation, the attractive forces no longer become negligible. So this is really what breaks down when we have high pressure and low temperature. So that's why we start to deviate under those two conditions is negligible volume is no longer true and negligible attractive forces are no longer true. Now, the ideal gas equation can be adjusted for real conditions. Now, these aren't really calculations we do all that much, but you need to understand if the gas is not behaving ideally, we can't use PV equals NRT anymore. So what we really have to do is fix the P and fix the V. Now, a scientist that was studying this was a scientist by the name of Van der Waal. Remember, Van der Waal forces it is an old term for looking at intermolecular forces. So he was studying the relationship between intermolecular forces and what was happening to ideal gas behavior. Now, what we're really doing here with A and B, A is correcting our pressure. So it's an intermolecular force correction that's really correcting our pressure. And the B value for a gas would be correcting the volume. So what we really have to do is, based on our pressures and our temperatures, how are we varying the P and the V? And that's going to be um, how we would fix this. So you would look up your gas, let's say helium, we would use that for our A value and that for our v, B value. And we would plug those in to this equation and would be the number of moles and we have our typical P, V, and T. So if we have a real gas situation, we can still handle it mathematically. The mathematics just become a little bit harder, a little bit more complex. And we also need to know what the A and the B values are. And these are experimentally determined values for different gases. So you can't actually calculate what A's and B's are for a gas. Those are things that would be experimentally determined. And what they really do is they fix their pressure and they fix their volume. And that's how we, we would handle real gases. And that ends our final set of notes over chapter 10.